Good morning, and welcome once again to my home studio here in Cardiff by the Sea. I wish you were all in front of me. It's much easier to work with a live audience, especially when you kind of have the the bent of humor. Sometimes it's dry, sometimes it's not. But when you laugh, I laugh. But if you're not there, I'm. I we'll get through it anyway. Today we're going to talk about the relationship of myself with two of the more, well, I think definitely the two most powerful composers of the 19th century. That would be Giuseppe Verdi, and the other one would be Richard Wagner. In my 30-year professional career, I sang more than 75 roles in 65 different operas in seven different languages. And the two composers uh, who I sang the most were Verdi and Wagner. I sang 11 different Verdi operas. Um, they were La Forza del Destino, La Traviata, Otello, Araldo, that was an unusual opera. That's recorded, by the way, on CBS Records. Aida, Balloween Maschera, Rigoletto Don Carlo, Simone Bocanegra, Nabucco, Falstaff, and I think that's it. <laughs> so that's, uh, I also sang Verdi's Requiem Mass, which is uh, sometimes referred to as his operatic mass, although it's not staged. I sang seven different Wagner roles. I sang, well, seven different Wagner operas. I sang three different roles in Tannhäuser in the course of time. I sang Das Rheingold, Valkyrie, Siegfried, Der Fliegende Holländer, and Lohengrin. Now, when you sing Verdi in Italy, it's very serious matter, you know. It, there's just... There's so much tradition, and there's so much hidden meaning and historic symbolism that kind of can slip by us, especially as Americans, and perhaps even by Italians today. But when he wrote his operas, they were very significant. Wagner, uh, on the other hand, I sang in Germany, is very much like going to church. <laughs> They are just so serious there about their Wagner. <clears throat> now, what we're going to do is do four excerpts. The first excerpt that we're going to watch is La Traviata, the overture from La Traviata. And it's not very long, about three and a half minutes long. And it's simple, very simple and poignant and emotional. And it comes back in the uh, in the opera. So let's first start with this overture from La Traviata and then we'll pick it up again.
So that was the overture to Verdi's opera, La Traviata. I sang La Traviata the very first time in 1975 in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, this is a trial by fire. My uh, uh, Violetta in that was none other than Beverly Sills. So <clears throat> that's when the first time I sang with Beverly Sills. And uh, let's see, that was that was in my first real professional year. Uh, there's not a, gr a bass role in that opera that's big to sing. The role that I did in that is called Dr. Grenville. And Dr. Grenville only sings a few times, a few solo lines, but he's always in the action because he's always kind of taking care of Violetta. Now, um, the music at the beginning of the da di da 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 also starts the last act. And um, in the first act, it's going to lead right into a party. And that's how you're going to find out what La Traviata is all about. In the fourth act, she's on her deathbed. So I did, an, I did a performance of this uh, in 19, must have been about 2001. And the stage director was Placido Domingo's wife. And, uh, oh, and the, the soprano was uh, Ana Martinez, who's the one who's doing the Mimi here now in San Diego. And uh, in that slow move, that slow part at the beginning, she had, this is the truth, she, she had the, um, the Grim Reaper dressed up as the Grim Reaper, very thin with a beard and the hat and the sickle walk slowly across the stage. I guess in case you didn't know that she was going to die, this was the thing that really cued you in. Now, Verdi's, well, I tell you what, let's listen to the next excerpt, which is an overture by Richard Wagner. Now, just like Verdi's opera is very clear and very simple, very poignant, Wagner's opera, and this is from an early Wagner's opera, this is from The Flying Dutchman. It was only like his third or fourth opera that he wrote. It's, um, it's huge. It's, you know, the, it's like Verdi times ten. The music is so thick and so wonderful. Also, it's long. <laughs> so this particular piece is going to run almost ten minutes. But let's give a listen now to the overture to... The Flying Dutchman.
the music that you just heard, the overture to the Flying Dutchman, you've heard a lot of the music that you're going to hear over the next, this is a pretty short opera by, by Wagner. I've even seen it done in one act uh, with Jean-Pierre Pinel's production at the Metropolitan Opera. It's only about two hours and 10 minutes of music. But the music at the beginning represents the, a huge storm. The, the next part takes us to the, my, my crew. I, in this opera, I play <clears throat> a ship's captain by the name of Dalant. And this is my, my crew is there with me. We're in this storm, and we end up on the shore uh, north of where we're supposed to be, but we're not concerned. So um, we're safe. I tell everybody, go ahead, take a nap if you want. You know, we'll figure this out. And this is, um, as only Wagner could do, the music that we just heard, we begin to hear it again. And all of a sudden, a, a ship appears, and that ship belongs to the Flying Dutchman. It's called the Flying Dutchman. And the captain of the Flying Dutchman has been cursed by somebody to spend seven years at sea with this crew. So you can imagine they're pretty salty. And um, they are allowed to come to shore one day every seven years. And in that day, if the captain, if the Flying Dutchman can find a woman who will swear her love to him, they will both die and he will be released from his curse. So we'll get into that in a few minutes when we talk about it. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about Wagner. Wagner's, all right, now if we go back to, to the history of music, it breaks down into periods. You have the Renaissance period, which ends about 1600. You have the Baroque period, which ends in 16, 1750. You have the Romantic period, the uh, uh, classical period, which ends like around maybe 1805, something like that. And then most of the 19th century is known as the Romantic period. Now, the, the Renaissance period kind of reached its peak. It couldn't go any further with what was the music of the Renaissance with the music of uh, Palestrina, Italian. Now, the music of the Baroque period was finally reached its culmination under Johann Sebastian Bach. The, um, I would say the, the classical period was highlighted by uh, Mozart and Haydn, but it kind of reached its peak and then transitioned into the Romantic period with the music of Beethoven. And Wagner is the one who took the concept of the Romantic period, which we won't go into now, but it's pretty self-explanatory just by the title. He took it right to, to its very limit, and that was sort of the end of the Romantic period. So his music, uh, when he composed an opera, it was very, very heavily orchestrated. And that was important to him. It was almost like there was a sea of orchestra. And then the, vo the voices were just sort of skating across it or skiing across it or sailing across it. You know, but the, the real meat of the Wagner opera is the, is the music. Now, um, he had, that was where he began. <laughs> it gets much worse. He finally gets to the point where he won't even refer to his music anymore as opera. He refers to them as musical drama. And uh, he has this idea that the, an opera as a piece of art is not something that somebody can write some, a libretto for and then he writes the music for and somebody else stages it. He believed that it was a he used to call it, there was a word, here's a real German word for you. It's called, um, let's see, it's called Gesamtkunstwerk, <laughs> which is total works of art. He wrote 
his own librettos. He wrote the, the libretto to the, the Ring. It took him like five years to write, to write the texts to The Ring, which comes later. Um, it got to the point where, well, the thing about Wagner opera is when you sing it, it's not really demanding vocally, except that it's gigantic. You have to sing over this huge orchestra. So you've got to be blessed with a real loud voice, which we refer to as a horn. And the, um, the melody is just, there's a melody to it, but there's a word that also Wagner created called Sprechtgesang, and that's spoken sung. So when we sing in German, we sing, Samt Schloss schlaf dein Aug, wir beide bauten Schlummerspar die Burg, like that. It's just, it's very, your diction's got to be perfect. It's something that you really have to work on if you're going to sing in German, in Germany. So, um, now, so now let's see, what else can we talk about? Opera, on the other hand, opera on the Italian side is, oh, there one more thing about Wagner's opera. They always have these kind of mythical or, or almost, well, mythical, I guess, was a good word for it, themes. Nordic mythical themes are, are very much in this one. The Flying Dutchman, for example, is a Nordic theme like that. The, um, the whole idea of the uh, Ring of the Nibelungen is very much like um, Tolkien's ring. You know, there's a ring. And it's all makes one all powerful, and at the end it gets thrown into the to the uh, back into the Rhine, and the whole world floods over, and the gods are replaced by people. That's what Goethe Dämmerung means, which is the last one. Goethe Dämmerung means the twilight of the gods. So, and then and then another myth that he used a lot was the myth of the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail being the chalice that was used by Christ at the Last Supper. Uh, it's, it's a part of Lohengrin. It's a part of um, Parsifal. And uh, it's definitely a huge part of uh, his opera. Well, let's see, there's Lohengrin and Parsifal. I guess that's the two that it mostly is. All right, and then now the third theme that he uses a lot is sort of medieval history in German and, and the idea of German nationalism and German oneness, which is, I think, why he was so popular with the Nazi movement. He was also a bit of an anti-Semite. Well, he was a big anti-Semite, but that was, you know, that was a very difficult time in Germany. You know, there was not a Germany even in the time of, of Wagner. It was rather all these little states, you know, that finally got together. There was this thing called, the, well, you know, it was all kind of coming together in the 19th century. So Wagner also became sort of a political figure and in a way an anti-political figure, so much so that for a period of six years from like in the 60s when he was in his 40s. By the way, they were both born in 1813, Verdi and Wagner. So he moved on to, um, um, where did he move on to? He moved on to Switzerland near Luzern, and he was there for six years, um, finished a lot of his work. And then another thing that he did, besides writing his own words and his own music, he wrote exactly how he wanted it staged, where he wanted people to be, and then the ultimate was he designed his own theater, and it's called the Bayreuth Theater, the Bayreuth Festspielhaus in Germany, and it's still there, and they do Wagner operas there. Very strange. I've never sung at the Festspielhaus, although I wish I could say that I had. I have actually never been to the Festspielhaus. Now, I want to play a piece of music by Wagner that I think really um, captures a lot of the things I've been talking about, the thickness of the music. Oh, this is from the opera Tristan and Isolde. This is another one that's about 
it's legendary. And it's the legend of Tristan and Isolde. Uh, Tristan in the opera is sent to Cornwall to bring back the princess Isolde to marry King Mark so that it will unite their kingdoms. And uh, Bringena, who is the um, handmaiden to um, Isolde, has a potion, a love potion, that when King Mark and, and Isolde drink it, they'll fall in love with each other, and that'll be the end of that. They'll be in love forever. But, you know, um, unfortunately, or fortunately for the opera, Isolde and Tristan drink it, and they fall in love with each other, which is a, a big problem, especially when he presents uh, Isolde to King Mark, because it's pretty obvious what's going on. And so King Mark banishes him, and uh, let me see, the one, one person even wounds, mortally wounds Tristan, and he moves out. So that, and, and then I don't know if he's old ever marries him or not. I did King Mark. Um, I did it a couple of times. My favorite performance probably of all times was very early in my career. I sang the role of King Mark in Tristan and Isolde at a special uh, New Year's Eve performance at Carnegie Hall. Uh, it was full. My parents came to it. They hadn't really heard me sing much opera at the time. And King Mark has a scene where he walks, uh, where he sings nine minutes. And my review said, Louis Lebherz was that rare bass that could actually save rather than destroy the second act, which I, I took as a good review. Um, now, so we're going to listen to the very end of the opera when, this is very Wagnerian too, Isolde has met Tristan, found him where he's hiding out, and he looks at her and he goes, ha, huh, and he dies. Well, she goes, oh my God, he's died. And she sings what's called the Liebestod, the love death. And she sings this beautiful, beautiful, sorrowful song where she dies. Now, another interesting thing that goes on in Tristan and Isolde, and this is a very Wagnerian thing, He's always modulating to different keys, and you think he's going to end a phrase, but he's just moving on. There's this thing that he puts in, in Tristan called the Tristan seventh chord, and you never know where it's going to go. And it's like this whole opera, which is really long. It's like three and a half, four hours long, where you're just going, you know, it's never going to end. It's never going to end, and it's during this piece that he finally resolves the Tristan seventh chord, and you'll hear that at the end. This is one of my favorites. The singer in this one is uh, another singer who was born the same year I was. I never sang with her, but I knew her, uh, a big, beautiful woman, Jessie Norman. So this is the Liebestod from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde with Jessie Norman. I have watched that clip a hundred times, I'm sure, you know, but to watch that music go, dee da 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 dee da 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 finally, finally resolves. What a piece of music. It's almost an opera all in itself. But once again, you can see it's not the singing that makes that piece work. I mean, of course it is. Jesse Norman's great. The size of her voice is huge. It's not a hard piece of music for a non-Wagnerian singer to sing because they don't have to have all the voice. So it's, it's not technically a difficult thing to sing, but goodness gracious, what a piece of music. Well, anyway, let's talk a little bit about Verdi. Okay, what, what makes Verdi different? Now, Verdi was the, the whole idea of, of Verdi is that when he wrote an opera, it was about real people, sometimes about real events, sometimes biblical, sometimes historic. Um, Aida is a good example. Uh, takes place between the Egyptians and the um, Ethiopians. The opera Nabucco, 
Uh, I, I had a, a, a friend in uh, Pacific Palisades when I used to sing at the LA Opera, and she went to see Nabucco, and she came back and she said, oh, she, she was a lovely Jewish lady, and she said, you know, I thought it was Japanese because it was Nabucco. That was a wonderful biblical opera. It was, it's really, the real name of it is Nebuchadnezzar. Or Nebuchadnezzar is the, uh, the tyrant, uh, the Babylonian tyrant, who held the Jews in captivity. It's about the Jewish captivity in Babylon. And at the end, uh, they all are converted uh, rather miraculously, and the Jews return to Israel. Um, oh, that was a great... I've done that up a, a jillion times. That's a, one of my favorite roles. The music of Verdi, like the overture which you heard, is very clean and, and very well written, very well led. And it's the idea of Palestrina taken to its romantic end as far as Italy is concerned. He, he's, his use of melody and of drama and, and the, the heartfelt um, sorrow. He, only one opera that he wrote, well, you wrote an earlier opera, but the last opera that he wrote is a comedy. All the other one, tragic. Somebody dies. Um, we're going to actually play an excerpt from Falstaff in a few minutes. But so that's that to me is the biggest difference between Wagner and Verdi is that the voice is free and and the fireworks uh, it takes it takes a great vocal technique pyrotechnics we even refer to it as you know to to sing Verdi's soprano roles uh, going back to La Traviata the the piece if you want to listen to something interesting sometime listen to the end of the first act of La Traviata, when Violetta sings Sempre Libera, which is also led in by, by uh, A Force Lui. Uh, it's, it's called a aria and a cabaletta, but it's really two different arias. And listen to that, and listen to the voice moving and firing along. That's Verdi. Wagner, boom, boom, you know, it's heavy, 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 big orchestration. I want to close this lecture, though, with what was, you know, the, Verdi's last opera, which he wrote, he wrote it when he was 82 years old, if you can imagine. Um, the opera that he wrote right before that, he was 75 years old, and he hadn't written anything from, he was from about age 60 until his middle 70s because he was depressed by the um, way that Wagner, Wagner and Wagnerianism was taking over the world. And it was when he came out with Othello and Falstaff that he said, you see, there's a different ways of looking at it. And so um, 82 years old when he wrote this. Wagner, by the way, died in, um, I guess he died in 83, 1883, at the age of 69, right before he turned 70. Um, this piece is from Falstaff, and it's, it's a very interesting piece because the most difficult piece of music that, that could be written, the most technically um, difficult piece of music, musicologically, is the fugue. And all of a sudden, at the end of this comic opera, Verdi brings everybody on stage. At, it, we're at the end of Falstaff, and we sing this huge, huge fugue. Everybody has their part, and it's called Tutto il mondo e burla. Now, so first of all, Wagner says, look, you see this fugue? That's music. And then he said, and all that, all that talking and all that singing, Tutto il mondo e burla means all of the world is a joke. So now we're going to listen to the finale from Falstaff by Giuseppe Verdi. Facciamo il parentado e che il ciel vi dia gioia Un core terminiamo la scena e con ser Falstaff tutti andiamo a cena Oh, 
torna l'uomo è nato burlone, burlone, burlone tutto nel mondo è burlone è nato burlone, burlone, burlone tutto nel mondo è burlone è nato burlone, burlone, burlone tutto nel mondo è burlone è nato burlone, burlone, burlone tutto nel mondo è burlone è nato burlone, burlone, burlone tutto nel mondo è burlone This is an opera I only sang twice with the Los Angeles Opera, and I sang the role of Pistole, Pistol. Uh, interesting that um, Ralph von Williams wrote an opera similar to this, same story, and it was called um, Sir John in Love, and that was in English. And um, Nikolai wrote uh, a German kind of musical version of it um, called um, The Merry Widow. No, no, not The Merry Widow. Um, the Merry Wives of Windsor, which I think is actually what they what it's all from, uh, the, the Shakespeare thing, The Merry Wives of Windsor. Notice that Shakespeare is the librettist for both of Wagner's last two operas. He didn't mess around. Some of his other librettists were uh, Goethe. That's a big one. Um... Oh, geez, I can't think of them right now. He, la, la, um, well, anyway, he <laughs> you know how that is at the end of a, of a lecture. But anyway, um, so that's a big difference. He used librettos. Boito was another one that he used. Um, he used. He had his librettists. Wagner was his own librettist. They both wrote their own music. Verdi's was Italian. Verdi's, Verdi was a huge historical figure during what was known as the Risorgimento, Risorgimento, I think is what it's called, which is just like in Germany when all of these duchies and things were coming together at the same time, Italy was a bunch of city-states, you know, and there was this big movement to 
separate and and have one or two or three different countries and the other and another one is to have a country that was based around Rome and the Pope and the king so Verdi uh, became like this this figure that people were cheering Verdi but they were also saying they were saying Viva Verdi V E R D I but what was implied was Vittoria Emanuele Re d'Italia so Victoria Emmanuel King of Italy so you can see that that was going on so we have two two political figures going in different directions one representing the German ideal this this very philosophical idea and then you have the Italian ideal the the one based on on love and emotion ah, Italians Italians they talk with their hands Germans talk like with their mouths the German sings, he, he says, uh, let me think of, he says, I'll, say, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a poem in German and a poem in Italian. A poem in German, let's see, what's a good one? Du hole Kunst in wie viel grauen Stunden, wo mich des Lebens wilde Kreis umstrickt, hast mich, hast mich in eine bessere Welt entrückt. That's basically the poem. In Italian, now in Italian. Amarilli, mia bella, non credi o del mio cor dolce desio, d'esser tu l'amor mio, credi lo pur, e se ti morta sale, aprimi il petto e vedrai scritto in core. Amarilli, e il mio amore. So thank you very much. I hope that that explains a bit of Wagner versus Verdi from the inside looking out. That is how I saw it as a singer and how as, as I have always thought it. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, God willing, we'll get through this virus and I really hope that uh, one day soon we'll be able to do one of these lectures face to face. I'll be back in five minutes for the Q&A and I look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much.